Well, um, I think to be totally honest, uh, I'm not really a pioneer of infectious disease as in a pioneer of infectious disease as the specialty has been defined. Because as you know, for many years, uh, clinical microbiologists um, have been doing the work that we infectious disease physicians do right now. So the transition occurred probably uh, beginning in the late 1970s, uh, moving on to the mid-1990s when I came back from the States. And of course, a lot of it was driven by Dr. David Allen, who I believe you have interviewed already. And uh, the transition was made from clinical microbiology to infectious disease. Um, infectious disease is a very exciting specialty. In fact, um, I always tell people the reason why I went into infectious disease was um, during my first uh, MO posting, I was doing cardiology and the consultant was, uh, supervising me was the famous uh, Professor Morris Chu and he suggested that I should do cardiology as a career. And I said to him, well, there are too few diagnoses. I said, you either have heart failure and arrhythmia or myocardial infarction. And his registrar said, yeah, and we managed to miss a few of them. And then he said, well, in that case, you should do infectious disease because there are thousands of diagnoses. And of course, he was trying to be funny, but um, there was a kernel of truth in that. And, um, and I think that's what attracted me to infectious diseases as a specialty. Uh, and I think that's what continues to attract people to clinical infectious disease as a clinical specialty. It's the enormous breadth uh, of, uh, of the specialty itself in that you can be dealing with uh, antimicrobial pharmacokinetics, you can be dealing with an emerging viral infection, you can do uh, parasitic infections in public health, um, and the training is broad enough to try and uh, cover all of those different areas. Well then, an ID physician has to be broad rather than deep in that sense. Although to be an academic ID physician, you have to be deep. Um, and as you know, I, I, I started out doing uh, work on UTI, and then when nobody wanted to fund that, I moved into influenza. Uh, and now all of a sudden people have started funding UTI work again, so I've gone back into, uh, into UTI work. But uh, I think flexibility, the ability to cover a wide range of topics, um, those are kind of the hallmarks of an uh, infectious disease physician. Another piece of advice that I received early on in my career in infectious disease was from Professor T. Tiawi, who was actually probably the first uh, certified infectious disease physician to work in Singapore. Um, and the interesting thing was nobody knew what an infectious disease physician was when she came back. So she couldn't get a job in the Department of Medicine and ended up in the Department of Pharmacology doing antimicrobial pharmacokinetics. And she told me, she said, you know, if you do infectious disease, she says, you don't have your own patients. You're looking after other people's patients. So, so I think that's the second hallmark of an infectious disease physician is that you have to learn how to talk to surgeons. Well, I think... Um, Overwhelmingly, the major milestones actually have to do with control of communicable diseases. Uh, and those would begin with the uh, eradication of malaria in the 1930s, uh, which of course was completed in the 1970s when Johor managed to get malaria eradicated, um, the elimination of typhoid, the advent of antibiotics. But from an academic point of view, I think the, the greatest achievements in Singapore have been um, the identification of the 1957 influenza by uh, Professor Lim Kok Lan and his team as well as the large-scale clinical trials of uh, polio vaccine, uh, the Sabin vaccine, which could not be done in the United States because salt was the dominant character in, in the US. So Sabin had to go to Russia and to Singapore to actually do his clinical trials. Uh, and those, I think, are examples of, of really um, world-class and uh, game-changing research that was done in Singapore that had an impact uh, globally. Well, I think the, the biggest issues are obviously emerging uh, viral infections. Um, Singapore is a very global city. We have got more than a million uh, people from outside the country uh, who are constantly commuting through Singapore. And so we are exposed to uh, a number of emerging pathogens that have come from all over the place. Um, the other issue, of course, which has captured the attention of the world in the last year or so has been uh, the issue of antimicrobial resistance. And um, to be very frank, I think... Uh, we are kind of sitting on a powder keg here because we have uh, very crowded and stressed public hospitals which also uh, feel the need to engage in medical tourism uh, in order to cover the costs um, uh, in view of the, the limited amount of uh, resources provided for them. So you have a situation where you've got a very crowded public hospital and you've got medical tourists coming in from countries where there's very high rates of uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. So there is the potential, uh, although it hasn't happened yet, uh, for the spread of very severe multi-resistant bacterial infections, as well as even mycobacterial infections such as tuberculosis. 
Yeah, well, again, I, I will concede that uh, I'm a pioneer infectious disease academic because, as I said, Prof T ended up in the Department of Pharmacology. So at least I got recognized for being an infectious disease uh, uh, expert in an academic department of medicine. Um, uh, I think there's huge opportunities, uh, and, and SARS in itself was a, was a tremendous wake-up call. Because, as you know, at the time of SARS, we didn't have a functioning BSL-3 laboratory. Uh, and now we have a number of BSL-3 laboratories. The university has finally been allowed to set up a BSL-3 laboratory more than 10 years after SARS. Um, and so we have the laboratory resources that are available. Um, this, this venue here is a, um, is a world-class uh, GCP-accredited uh, clinical trial center. So we are able to do clinical trials uh, of um, emerging therapeutics, vaccines, and, and a number of these things. Uh, the genomics resources that are available at GIS and other institutes are also uh, uh, tremendous. So, so we, w we have the ability to sequence emerging pathogens when they do appear. Um, and of course, we are very small. You see? So that's a huge advantage because we are uh, nowhere in Singapore is more than half an hour, 45 minutes away. Uh, even if you want to take a drive down to NTU, you know, the most it will take you 45 minutes or an hour. And you can, you can bring your samples over for whatever lab or uh, resources that are available over there. So, so I think that while we are vulnerable to uh, emerging pathogens, um, I think the infrastructure has been built up. The challenge is to provide the human resources to fill these. And, um, and here is where, again, uh, some of the ways in which um, the academic scene is, is moving uh, may have unintended consequences of, of limiting the prospects of young academics. Um, and in particular, I'll be very frank, it's the issue of the rankings. And I think uh, the Prime Minister even has recognized this. Because if you get too obsessed with the rankings, um, you end up hiring 70-year-olds who have very high citation rates uh, just to keep your standing up in the rankings, which may be good in the short term. But in the long term, the future of Singapore is going to depend on 35-year-old to 40-year-old uh, bright young researchers who, who are going to be able to chart a course and have the, uh, the energy to to really move uh, uh, academic infectious disease research forward. Uh, and unless we really go out of our way to look out for these individuals, to nurture them, to give them opportunities, to give them access to, to some of the resources that are available, um, the, the long-term future of academic infectious disease research in Singapore is a bit questionable. In fact, uh, some of these papers here that I brought uh, are papers from the 1950s and 60s when we had people like uh, Professor Wong Hock Boon, Chan Yao Chong, uh, uh, Professor Lim Kok An, who are regularly publishing in Science and Nature. Um, and that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. Uh, partly it's because of the complexity of academic research now. Um, in those days, Singapore was one of the few um, you know, academic medical centers. So we had the ability to have the, the leadership um, there was also less uh, infrastructural constraints. I mean, the way that Professor Lim identified the influenza A is really amazing. A friend of his called him up and said he had uh, workers in Pulau Brani reporting sick on May 1st, which was a public holiday. So he was able to rush down, collect the samples, isolate them without having to worry about an MTA or an IRB and all the other structural things which seem to constrain uh, research in, in Singapore today. So, so I think um, what I would really like is if we could go back to that kind of era where we take advantage of Singapore's uh, resources, the infrastructure, and the small size, uh, and we do real world-class cutting-edge research. Yeah, so university rankings are, are the well-publicized QS rankings, or the Times Higher Educational System rankings, uh, which have gotten a lot of publicity. They are actually, the QS ranking is actually a kind of a marketing tool. Uh, which is developed by a commercial company and depends a great deal on, um, on certain metrics such as a citation rate. Uh, and a citation rate describes the number of times a, a particular research paper has been published. So it's obvious that if a research paper was published 20 years ago and it is a good paper and it's been read by many people and it's referenced by many people, it's going to have a high citation rate. Whereas if a paper was published two years ago, the number of people who have read the paper and the number of people who have cited this paper is going to be much lower. So the result of which is that a 70-year-old is, is by default, if a competent academic at the age of 70, is likely to have far more citations than a, a bright young academic at the age of 35. And I think that, um, that kind of metric, uh, obsessing with that kind of metric, uh, is going to have long-term detrimental effects uh, on, on academic development in Singapore. Yeah, well, I think we're doing a number of things that, that are necessary. Uh, in other words, building up laboratory capacity. 
um, building up the ability to do clinical trials, funding uh, clinical trials in innovative uh, therapeutics as well as in vaccine development. There are two gaps which um, have been identified and we are trying to plug in. The first is the vaccine manufacturing capability. Um, and I know that Ministry of Health has tried for years to get a major manufacturer to set up a vaccine manufacturing plant here without a lot of success. Um, and part of the reason is the huge amount of startup costs that are involved in manufacturing a biological to uh, FDA or EMEA standards. Um, and I think, you know, we have to have a paradigm shift. You see, what they've done is they've gone to the big guys, the, the big pharma players. Uh, and again, this is part of the whole ecosystem idea. We need to build up our own uh, local vaccine manufacturing capability. It's not going to be easy, um, but you know, we've done it. We've built up uh, world-class banks. We've built up world-class airlines. Uh, and I think that there's no good reason why we cannot build up a world-class uh, vaccine manufacturing company that can, uh, can manufacture for the region, can manufacture for the world. The second area is in the area of a good laboratory practice. Um, and this is what they call a GLP. Uh, and it's kind of embarrassing that Singapore does not have a GLP accredited laboratory. Um, we do have ability to send samples to GLP laboratories through a commercial provider. But uh, in terms of a public GLP laboratory um, in an academic medical center or a teaching hospital, we do not have that facility at the moment. So it's kind of embarrassing because we had we ran a flu study and we had to send the samples to Mahidol University in Thailand, which is a by, by definition a middle income or third world country. But uh, they have put in the investment together with contributions from the Oxford University group um, and built up the GLP capacity. So I think uh, for m many of us who are investigators, we hope that um, there would be a f uh, ability to develop this kind of capacity to have uh, a very high level laboratory that can, can be a national resource, you know, for, uh, in a way, maybe a bit like, like how GIS started out uh, originally, supposedly, as a national resource for genomics. And maybe we can learn some of the lessons, <laughs> some of the, the things that happened along the way. But, but if we could have a GLP lab that's a national uh, resource, I think that would make a huge difference. It's the same thing, because a, a GLP lab will also be able to do therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, and I think, you know, in the absence of uh, a new drug development for antimicrobial resistance, a lot of it will have to come from um, more efficient use of existing antimicrobials. Um, and if we have uh, GLP accredited um, means of measuring uh, drug levels and uh, synergy and a lot of those, I know a lot of these things are going on um, in small scale and research funded efforts by, by many investigators in Singapore. But, uh, but really to move it to the next level, you have to have uh, um, you know, high level uh, GLP accredited laboratories. Uh, and that would also help with drug development because um, if we are able to do the assays in Singapore themselves, then you know, it would make it easier for, for all these uh, basic scientists to come and try out their drugs. Yeah, well, the clinical management of HIV is drastically different. I mean, HIV in Singapore is no longer, anywhere in the world is no longer a, a life sentence. Um, and that has been the result of drug development that's occurred primarily in North America, but also in other parts of the world, in Europe and in Japan. Um, the challenge in Singapore is trying to translate that into actual patient care um, and to deal with the stigma and discrimination which persist. Um, the reassuring thing is that there have been small steps that have been taken to try and eliminate the stigma and discrimination. For example, the travel ban on individuals with HIV has been lifted uh, quietly um, earlier in this year. Um, spouses of individuals with HIV can now stay on in Singapore, although there are certain constraints. They get long-term visit passes rather than PR. Uh, those are non-Singaporean spouses of uh, individuals with HIV. And uh, there's some indication, although this has not been confirmed, that MediShield Life will cover HIV-related diseases. Uh, again, we haven't had an explicit announcement about this, but the indication is, uh, and if this happens, it will be tremendous because then um, other insurance companies should take their cue from, from MediShield Life. Uh, and hopefully that will make a, make a difference in terms of the management of HIV patients who can then get access to medications which, um, which have changed uh, the clinical face of HIV uh, worldwide. Yeah, I do actually. In fact, uh, you know, looking back, uh, preparing for this interview and for other talks that I give on academic infectious disease research in Singapore, I cannot help but be impressed by the kind of work that was done uh, by, by people like Professor Montero, Professor Lim, and uh, Dr. Chan Yao Chong, and all these other people. And, and what, 
you know, I'm a bit of an idealist, and I see that what they did was actually look at the infectious disease problems of the day, uh, influenza, polio, and, and then they, they drove their research around those problems, the, around the major public health problems, um, and, and they, they got support from the community, from the institutions around them, um, and they tried to address these, and they actually did, were not afraid of contacting the people who are the worldwide leaders in the field. Uh, as you know, Professor Lim was in contact with uh, McFarlane Burnett and uh, uh, Professor Montero wrote to Albert Sabin himself and he was in touch with him. Um, and, and in collaboration with, uh, with really the world-class leaders of the field, they were able to introduce uh, interventions and study them in, uh, in, in high-quality clinical research settings uh, to make a difference to, to, um, to public health. Uh, and so my vision is that, you know, our research is not driven by impact factor or trying to achieve a high certain citation rate, but we look at what are the, the major pressing public health issues. Um, and uh, many of these are infectious disease, for example, like tuberculosis. You see, the fact that we, tuberculosis control in Singapore seems to have plateaued. Um, you know, there's, there's no good reason why we can't be at the forefront of trying to eliminate tuberculosis as the uh, TBCU is trying to do. Um, and uh, as well as other, um, you know, infectious diseases. And so to my mind, the two big ones would be tuberculosis and antimicrobial resistance because we have the resources here. But if we focus on a public health approach, so you're trying to eliminate what is a, a, a real public health problem rather than trying to publish in, in some obscure high-impact journal, you know, then I think uh, uh, we can really make a contribution not just to Singapore but to the rest of the world.